Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christian Sines, a fourth year economics PhD student at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by C. Shang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Oxford, and Mike Pesco at University of Missouri. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter after, even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Michael Darden from Johns Hopkins University to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Christian. Uh, yeah, so today we're gonna continue the summer and fall 2023 season with a grand rounds presentation by Rachel Cassidy from Brown University um, entitled Nicotine Reduction Policy to Reduce Youth Tobacco Use, Promise and Pitfalls. This presentation was selected via competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. If you'd like to present with TOPS, please submit your presentation proposal at uh, tobaccopolicy.org backslash call. Um, so Dr. Cassidy is an Associate Professor of Behavior and Social Sciences and Vice Chair of the Brown University School of Public Health. Dr. Cassidy is also a pr Principal Investigator of the Smoking, Health, and Addiction Research Lab at Brown. She's an experimental psychologist by training with experience in young adult and adolescent tobacco use and a particular focus on tobacco regulatory science. Her research focuses on key policies, treatments, and behavioral processes critical to understanding youth tobacco use with the goal of increasing cessation and reducing initiation. Dr. Cassidy's work focuses on how enacting a nicotine reduction standard may affect youth. Dr. Cassidy also applies behavioral economic framework to understand substance use and applies that framework to tobacco regulatory science. So our discussant today is gonna to be Dr. Jamie Hartman Boyce from the University of Oxford. Dr. Rachel Cassidy, thank you for presenting for us today. Hey, thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see that fine? Okay, great. So thanks again for joining me this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about nicotine reduction policy to reduce tobacco use, both the promise of this policy and potential pitfalls and caveats that we need to keep in mind as we move to implementation of this policy. And I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and for my talk today, I'm gonna to focus in the first part about an overview of my work in this area. Um, and focusing on nicotine reduction as an exemplar of a tobacco control policy that has transformational potential, but also needs to be carefully considered. Um, and so in part two, I'll talk about some potential challenges and opportunities for this policy, and also talk about connections to other potential tobacco po regulatory policies, such as a menthol ban. And I'll pause in between the two parts for any questions that you may have. So what is nicotine reduction? So nicotine reduction is a policy proposal that would reduce the level of nicotine in cigarettes that's allowable in commercially available cigarettes. So this would be something that the FDA would set as a product standard that would affect all of the cigarettes that are being sold in the United States. And the goal of this is to reduce the addictiveness of cigarettes and other combustible tobacco products in order to move people away from these products and towards um, quitting. And clinical trials with adults have shown that smokers who are asked to switch to these cigarettes reduce their cigarette consumption and reduce, therefore, their exposure to toxicants. And there's been a lot of work in adults and as well as other vulnerable populations, such as individuals with serious mental illness, schizophrenia, um, and individuals with opioid use disorder. But we were wondering, what about youth? While adolescent smoking, as many of us know, is at historic lows, which is great, 
Many youths continue to use tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. And also the age of smoking initiation has risen to college aged young adults, whereas before most people initiated smoking um, prior to age of 18. Now we're getting into people initiating age 19, 20 ish. So we're starting to look beyond just the traditional um, kind of under 18 group. And smoking in these age groups exacerbates health disparities as smoking tends to be concentrated among marginalized youth, such as sexual and gender minority youth. I'm not going to speak about that in detail, but just know that within our samples, we see a lot of sexual and gender minority youth, and we are interested in and do analyze those data separately. So we're concerned about this not only for its effects across the lifespan, but for its individual for its effects and priority populations. And youth are different from adults. They tend to be lighter and more intermittent smokers, um, and they also have much shorter histories of nicotine exposure. And they have different motivations for smoking relative to adults. And all of these things mean that they might respond differently to a nicotine reduction policy. So my research program is focused on answering the question of what a nicotine re reduction policy would um, look like for youth and how it might affect them. So in terms of an overview of the policy studies that I've conducted, um, I have a series of studies that focused on the effects of this policy in younger adolescents, so 15 to 19 year olds or 15 to 20 year olds. Um, the first study I'll be talking about is an acute laboratory study where we um, just looked at kind of the initial effects of these cigarettes in youth and whether they uh, reduced withdrawal. And we conducted a longer term trial that I'll be talking about next, where we asked participants to switch to these cigarettes for a number of weeks. And I'll also be speaking about studies of this, these policies in young adults, so 18 to 24 year olds, that's like the older age group that we're interested in. Um, and in those studies, we were directly comparing younger adults, uh, younger adults to older adults to see if younger adults responded differently to these changes to their older peers. So the first question that we asked was just do these very low nicotine content cigarettes reduce withdrawal and craving? We know that in adults they do, but we didn't know if this would be the case for younger folks. So first we tested this using a within subject study of 50, 15 to 19 year old daily smokers who came into the lab following overnight abstinence. And I'm gonna go into the method in detail here, but um, just know that for each of the following studies, the inclusion and exclusion criteria and all that good stuff were similar across studies. So I won't go into detail for the later ones as they're quite similar. But generally we had, we included participants who had been smoking for at least six months. They had to um, report daily smoking and we confirmed their smoking status biochemically. They had to be not currently intending to quit, endorsing suicidal ideation or pregnant. And for this particular study, we administered several doses of cigarettes. Um, the cigarettes are shown here, the Spectrum cigarettes, they're manufactured by NIDA. Um, and for this study, we had four counterbalance laboratory session in a within subjects design. And we asked subjects to be abstinent from smoking overnight. And the four doses that we tested were um, a normal nicotine content cigarette, which is just a control cigarette. So it's a research cigarette, but it has the same amount of nicotine as any other cigarette on the market, two moderate doses, and then a very low dose. And again, the purpose of this was to see whether these very low nicotine content cigarettes would have similar effects on abstinence outcomes as they do in adults and what the sort of threshold would be. You know, are these middle doses just as good as the lower dose at reducing withdrawal? And that would help us figure out what kind of dose we should be going for in a nicotine reduction policy as we are not allowed to reduce nicotine to zero. Do, I wanna note here and elsewhere that the 0.4 point, point milligram per gram yield for cigarette is very low, it's not behaviorally active. So it's not zero, but we don't have evidence that it's behaviorally active. So in terms of abstinence, we found that regardless of dose, um, all of the cigarettes reduced withdrawal effects. So you can see um, the black bars are when they came into the lab, as you can see that they have high withdrawal in the top left corner, um, high craving in the right two panels, and then high negative affect in the bottom left panel. And then the gray bars are post smoking of each cigarette. So you can see all the gray bars are lower, just showing that all of the cigarettes reduced these abstinence effects. And we didn't see um, differences in how the, well these cigarettes did in reducing withdrawal or negative affect, but we did see that the higher doses of nicotine reduced craving to a greater extent than the lower nicotine doses. <laughs> 
In contrast, we saw more of an effective nicotine content on subjective effects. So we can see here that the very low nicotine content cigarettes were associated with significantly lower psychological reward and smoking satisfaction. And while the, are, they are significant, these difference across doses are modest. Um, you can see that clinically, the difference between you know, a score of two and three on a Likert scale is not huge. Um, and what we found was that generally, um, participants did not like the BLNC cigarettes and very low nicotine content cigarettes, which is good because that means that they have lower abuse liability, which is what we want, of course. But they also didn't care much for the normal nicotine content cigarettes either. And this is in contrast to adults. And this is kind of a theme of what we found with youth is that they are not, um, the control cigarettes are not quite a good control for them. They tend to not like them more than adults. Adults seem to be generally okay with the normal nicotine content cigarettes. We also um, conducted a hypothetical purchase task, which asks how many cigarettes participants would purchase if they were free up to very high prices. And this is a measure of the reinforcing value of a substance. So how, you know, the extent to which you continue to purchase it in the face of increasing prices is a measure of how much you value that substance. So what we see here is that while usual brand is above all of the other doses, there were no differences between doses of nicotine content, meaning we like they like their usual brand a lot more than they liked all of the research cigarettes, and they didn't care much about the differences between research cigarettes on this particular measure of reinforcing efficacy. And again, this is in contrast to adults where we saw much more of a dose-dependent effect. So, so far, we see more moderate differences in terms of the effects of nicotine content in youth. Most of those differences tend to be in things like subjective effects, but less so in this measure of reinforcing efficacy and in other aspects of withdrawal. So this was just one study with a brief exposure. Again, they just subsampled each cigarette one time in the lab after following abstinence. So we wanted to see if extended exposure would replicate these effects, if we might see more differences after a longer period of exposure. So adolescents in this study were asked to switch to using a very low nicotine content cigarette or a normal nicotine content cigarette for three weeks. So after a usual brand baseline, they were randomized to either a very low nicotine content cigarette or a control. And they came into the lab once a week and they reported on how many cigarettes they smoked. And we also asked them to be honest in their reporting of using their usual brand and encourage them to not do that and to use only their study cigarette. And they were matched on menthol preference. So if they preferred menthol for their usual brand, they were given the menthol spectrums. So the laboratory sessions were as follows. We had some um, pre-smoking uh, assessments and then they smoked cigarettes in the lab at each session. So we could look at some laboratory measures as well. And in terms of the age of these participants, they were about 18.5. Um, and they'd been um, smoking about eight cigarettes per day. So relatively heavy smokers for this group. And they'd been smoking on average for about two years. So what we found is that nicotine reduction is likely to reduce smoking in adolescents. In the left panel, we can see that after three weeks, um, those in the VLNC group reduced their smoking relative to the NNC group. In terms of total nicotine equivalence, which again is the amount of nicotine that we um, that's in someone's system as we measured it by a urine. Um, after week three, both groups declined in terms of their total nicotine equivalents, but we didn't see a group difference, which is interesting. Um, and maybe due to the fact that, again, even those participants in the normal nicotine content group didn't particularly like those cigarettes and may have been smoking less of them. And I wanted to put here, this is uh, the main outcome from Eric Donnie's 2015 paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine with adults showing a very similar pattern after six weeks of exposure in adults when we compare the 0.4 milligram um, BLNC to the NNC group. So it's really cool that we were able to replicate a very similar finding in adolescents, which increases our confidence that this would be a beneficial policy for youth. So in terms of a summary, we found that all the research cigarettes we tested significantly reduced indicators of abuse liability. And over time, VLNC exposure reduced smoking, but the biomarkers suggest other sources of nicotine, um, as with adults, meaning that we can't control what they do outside of the lab, of course. And so much like we see in other studies, we know that 
adolescents are using other things, but overall we did see a decrease in nicotine exposure. And the reinforcing efficacy and subjective effects again show that all of the research cigarettes are disliked to a greater extent than they are in adults. So that complicates the picture somewhat. And it shows that adolescents are somewhat less driven by differences in nicotine than adults. So when we're thinking about differences between younger and older adults, you know, we have we're including only young adults in the studies I've discussed so far. So we our next step was to look at a larger sample to see if we could directly compare younger adults and older adults in the same study to see if they're really responding differently or if perhaps this is an artifact or something about our study design and it's not kind of a meaningful difference. So we turn to the scenic study that I just noted a few slides ago as Eric Donnie's 2015 study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a very large study that included 595 older adults and 93 18 to 24 year old young adults within the sample. So we looked at the moderating effect of age on cigarettes per day and also subjective effects of the cigarettes um, at week two and also at week six. So we found that after two weeks of use in terms of smoking, oops, sorry, smoking satisfaction, which is the top two panels, young adults, which are the black bars, and specifically young adults, those that were in the very low nicotine content group, so the farthest uh, of the four bar group bars, they showed lower subjective responses to the BLNC cigarettes relative to older adults. So you can see um, where the asterisk is, is located in the left two panels, where the younger adults liked the cigarettes even less than older adults in terms of smoking satisfaction and psychological reward. But this effect dissipated after six weeks as adults tended to reduce their ratings of the LNC cigarettes over time to be more similar to the younger adults. We also saw that when controlling for baseline cigarettes per day, young adults in the VLNC group, the, again, at the far right of these groups of bars and these two panels, they reduced their smoking to a greater extent than older adults. And this also dissipated by week six as they became more similar. So the next question that we had, now that we know that we've kind of, we're seeing something real, that young adults tend to especially dislike BLNC cigarettes, even relative to older adults, which again is good. That shows an even you know reduced abuse liability, even relative to older adults. And that's just translating into reduced smoking consistently, even reduced relative to older adults. Another question that we wanted to know was about how we should implement this policy. So should a nicotine product standard be implemented immediately. So we just mandate that all of the nicotine has to come out of the cigarettes right away or gradually, you know, so kind of asking that cigarette companies step down nicotine gradually over time. There's a concern that perhaps, you know, pushing everybody into withdrawal so quickly, maybe that's not ideal. Maybe we should give some, you know, a kind of a step down approach. And within that question, would young people respond differently than older adults to these two different types of policy implementation? So for this study, we turned also to the scenic trial. This was a study conducted by Dorothy Hatsukami and the scenic colleagues over 20 weeks. And this was a very large study of 1,250 people. And following two weeks of usual brand baseline, participants were randomized to one of three groups. The control group was given a normal nicotine content cigarettes throughout all of the 20 weeks. The immediate reduction group similarly was giving very low nicotine content cigarettes for the duration of the 20 weeks. Those two groups are very similar to what we've just been discussing in terms of my trial and the original scenic trial, but just a longer period of time. But the interesting part was the gradual reduction group. In this group, they were given their research cigarettes monthly and these cigarettes reduced in dose over time so that they eventually reached um, the very low nicotine content dose at the last um, for the last month and starting from normal nicotine content. And overall, Dorothy's study showed that there was a significant decrease in cigarettes per day in the immediate group, but not in the gradual or control groups. In other words, in terms of reducing cigarette exposure, an immediate reduction was better for that outcome. So was that true for young adults as well? 
we found in this graph, we can see that in the top um, panel at visit two, and then going down in this column for smoking satisfaction, which is again, a subjective response, we can see that smoking satisfaction goes down immediately in the immediate group, as you would expect. But at week four, there's only a difference in smoking satisfaction in the gradual group. And the gradual group starts to look like the immediate group by the time we get to week 20, but the overall scores are higher. So that's what I mean right there in the immediate group. And I also want to point out here that, again, we've replicated our findings from the previous trial where young adults in the immediate group, again, the VLNC group, they like those VLNC cigarettes a lot less than their older counterparts, and that persisted in this study even to week 20. And that was also true for psychological reward in the immediate group, as well as enjoyment of the respiratory sensations from the cigarettes. So again, we're seeing reduced abuse liability of these cigarettes in younger adults, even relative to older adults. Overall, the study found, again, that immediate reduction would be best. And we also found that that was true for young adults as well. And young adults also, again, had reduced cigarettes per day relative to older adults in the immediate condition. So again, replicating those findings that not only do young adults dislike VLNCs more than older adults, they also smoke fewer of them controlling for cigarettes per day at baseline. So we feel confident that actually it's possible that this policy might even have more beneficial effects on younger adults because they seem to like these cigarettes so much less. So in terms of the summary of the young adult results that we've gotten so far, we found that compared to older adults, younger smokers from ages 18 to 24 showed greater dislike for and lower use of low nicotine content cigarettes across the two studies. So again, that really suggests that a reduced nicotine standard may reduce the abuse potential of cigarettes to an even greater extent among young adults than it may even among adults, which is really exciting. And in terms of gradual versus immediate, both younger and older adults who were switched immediately to the lowest content of nicotine, smoked fewer cigarettes per day and had lower nicotine in intake than those in their gradual, gradual condition, which suggests that an immediate implementation of a nicotine product standard would be better than gradual for both age groups, which I always think is a little bit surprising, but I think the results kind of speak for themselves showing that this leads to lower toxin exposure over time and better outcomes. So I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions prior to moving on to some caveats about implementation and some research gaps that we're looking to fill. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, we're going to we're transition to the discussion from uh, Jamie Hart Boyce. Uh, Boyce, excuse me. Hi. Thanks so much, Rachel. I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead to something that's coming in the second half. Feel free to say you need to wait, Jamie. <laughs> um, but I was so interested in seeing that uh, and was curious about what other forms of nicotine people might have been using in those studies and if that is something that you guys were monitoring or just something that you're aware of and might look at in future studies. So I didn't know if you could talk to that a little bit. That is actually one of my things I'm about to talk about. <laughs> but yes, just to say that in those previous studies, we primarily excluded people who used um, other alternative nicotine products more than nine days in the last month, primarily for biomarker reasons. And then the next study that I'll talk about, we explicitly included youth who use other products to see what the effects would be on those. So I'll talk about that in just a second. Great question. Fascinating. And just one more question around research in adolescence, I suppose. Like I had always kind of been led to believe that basically it was impossible to get a study done where you gave adolescents cigarettes, even if those adolescents were people who already smoked or similarly, that it was impossible to study where you gave adolescents e-cigarettes. And I'm wondering now if that was a British thing and <laughs> the States is easier to do, or if you guys encountered problems in trying to do that. No, it is hard. I actually gave a workshop on this because people have this question all the time and it is complicated. The short answer is in addition to all the normal things you have to do working with adolescents, which includes verbal and written parental consent, adolescent verbal assent, and all of the normal IRB procedures and FDA over site because we're giving them research cigarettes, we also needed to get approval from the Rhode Island Attorney General um, as a waiver of prosecution that you know, we're giving these cigarettes and you know it's for research purposes, but 
with um, but that varies state to state. It happens to be that our state can, you know, we are allowed to use them for research purposes, whereas in other states, that's not the case. And then we had to renegotiate that once Tobacco 21 came around because then suddenly all of our sample was now considered minors for tobacco purposes. So yes, it is, it is definitely, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, and we're lucky that we've had a good relationship with our attorney general who kind of understands the purpose of it. But yeah, great question. Fantastic. Thank you. Well done on jumping through this. <laughs> That's it from me for this section. Okay, great. One question from the chat, um, uh, which was, it was similar to what, what Jamie just asked, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. So, so as far as the nicotine product standard, do you think that the, the similar uh, study could translate to include uh, e-cigarettes? Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm about to talk about. But I will say that we modeled, you know, the government, the way the FDA has worded what it said so far about how this policy would work is that it would affect combustible products primarily. It may be extended to non combustible products later on, but for the purposes of these studies, we modeled a scenario where cigarettes have lower nicotine, but e cigarettes have the same amount they have now. And do you think about policy implementation of a lower nicotine uh, standard? Uh, for cigarettes in isolation, or is it something that you would think about jointly with like e-cigarette policy? So, I mean, for the given level of taxes for e-cigarettes as they are now, mm -hmm. it, this is the optimal policy, you think? That's a great question. Actually, I didn't have time to include it in this in this presentation, but we just concluded a study where we looked at a combination of um, not just VLNC versus NNC, but also characteristics of e-cigarette, um, you know, so flavors versus not having any flavors, different um, levels of nicotine in um, in e-cigarette liquid, e liquid that's allowed, for example, and looked at how those different characteristics led to different choices to smoke, you know, which of these kind of combinations led to lower smoking choice. Um, and so those results are upcoming, but we are very interested in that. And I think I think that, you know, low nicotine standard is a great thing to have. It's a great start. We always want to move people towards, um, you know, moving away from combustible products. But for youth, there's the additional caveat of this. We don't really want youth using e-cigarettes, you know, more so than maybe adults. Okay, this is maybe harm reduction. But with young people, we want to move them kind of as far towards quitting as we can. And so that's something that we think about a lot in, in, po in policy implementation that I'll discuss in the next part is how do we move to that goal. Great, thanks. So um, I guess uh, move on to part two. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. So as promised, potential pitfalls and areas for future work. While I just told like a nice story about how this is going to be so great, we think we all know that that's, you know, overly simplistic. There's a lot of things we need to think about. One thing that I think a lot about are risk perceptions. So in our lab study, the one that I mentioned first, where we just had acute um, administration, we assessed perceived risk in our by asking, um, compared to my usual brand of cigarettes, my risk for the following diseases are lower, higher, than, or the same. Um, and we're interested in this because it's a little bit um, of a threading the needle because reducing the nicotine in cigarettes makes them less addictive. That is true, but they're still combustible cigarettes. So, you know, if we just smoke the same number of them, then we're experiencing all, you know, the toxins from all of the smoke. Um, and so we don't want adolescents to think that these products are safer, right? They're less addictive, but they're not really safer in, you know, in the sense besides that you're not getting nicotine exposure, still getting all of that harmful smoke exposure. So we wanted to see what adolescents thought about these, um, about risk perceptions of these cigarettes. And to keep in mind in this study, it was double blind administration. So they did not know what dose they were getting and neither did the researcher. And we didn't give them any specific information about the cigarettes at all. So this is not like how it would be in the real world, but this is just to give us an idea of what about the cigarette itself might be signaling to youth that it has different risk parameters than a normal cigarette. And indeed participants did report a lower risk of developing lung cancer and other cancers and other diseases when smoking VLNC cigarettes relative to NNC cigarettes. And so that's a concern. Again, this is in the absence of even being told anything. This is just something about the cigarettes themselves um, that we led participants to think that they were a little bit safer. So we delve deeper into um, some qualitative reactions to the cigarettes themselves. Many participants noted things like they are, um, they tasted like air or they just didn't have that same throat hit and something about that kind of made them think that they were lighter cigarettes or less harmful. And we also, we wanted to know about 
how young people would perceive this policy. Um, would they support it? W would they understand the intentions of it? So for the next couple of studies that I'm going to talk about, we um, conducted some qualitative interviews with participants who had actually experienced VLNC cigarettes in the context of our studies. So in this particular study, young participants were exposed to VLNC cigarettes in the lab briefly, and then the policy itself was, was described to them, um, the kind of rationale for why we would do it, um, you know, what it would mean, and then we asked for their reactions and whether or not they would support this policy or what they would think about that. And the interviews highlighted that participants were really not convinced that the policy would be effective and were also distrustful of the intent of the policy as well. Um, one person uh, mentioned that I feel like addiction is more broad than the nicotine itself. You know, it's also the act of going outside, sitting in our lawn, for example, smoking the cigarettes for five minutes where you're doing nothing, but you're smoking that cigarette. I think you have a very limited view of what addiction is, which I thought was really um, insightful. And concerningly, we also, we also um, did another series of studies um, in this study and another qualitative study that I'll talk about in a moment, where we asked people what they would do if this policy came into, into play. And some did express that they would switch to other products. Um, so one person said, wherever the nicotine is, I'll go there. I'd probably just do Juul again. Um, another participant said, I would definitely use those nicotine pou pouches that you put under your lip. I think those are called Zin, also Shisha or Hookah. So this points to the need for, you know, messaging around the policy itself and making sure we're kind of pitching this policy and you know getting broad support for this policy among youth. And we really are interested in what participants would do in the real world. So in our other um, qualitative study, which was conducted after three weeks of exposure, so now participants in this study have had exposure to VLNC cigarettes for quite a long time, these participants in the VLNC group um, had many different reactions, but we had a variety of reactions. So some people said, I think over a period I'd probably quit. I think it would lead me to stop smoking. So that's great. That's what we want. But we did see other people saying I'd probably still smoke them depending on the price. So despite disliking them, um, many there were a significant number of participants, um, a concerning number, I guess you should say, who said that they would continue to smoke. And others, again, expressed that they would use other alternatives. Um, or in things like try rolling their own cigarettes from loose tobacco or using um, other types of products. So again, highlighting the need to make sure that we are really paying attention to what adolescents might do in terms of other product use. So that's going to focus of another um, study that we just completed, an R01 that I had that we just completed. As we all, I'm sure, are aware, adolescents commonly use other tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. And as a nicotine reduction policy would reduce the reinforcing efficacy of cigarettes, um, then it's possible that adolescents would switch to other tobacco products. So the difference between this study and the studies that I spoke about previously is that, again, we enrolled participants who reported the use of at least one other tobacco product in the last month. It could be anything, either combusted or non. Um, and this is much more representative of what the average youth who smoke cigarettes does. Many, many of them use tobacco, other tobacco products at high rates. So this is just a schematic of um, the study. Again, very similar to the studies that we've discussed, except that we had four weeks of exposure to this um, to the VLNC cigarettes. And I'm going to be focusing on um, the baseline two sessions. So the very first time that they were exposed to their study cigarette was in the lab, and then after that they were asked to switch. And then at the week four lab session. So one task that we use to look at um, other product use is called the experimental tobacco marketplace. This is a behavioral economic task that simulates a real world marketplace. In the ETM, the only cigarette available was their study cigarette. And other products included just other products that are typically on the market. So cigarillos, little cigars, smokeless tobacco, jewel, disposable e-cigarettes, e-liquid, and nicotine replacement gum. And the flavors were available based on what we currently had in Rhode Island. And across trials, um, the study cigarette prices increased. So this is similar to a hypothetical purchase task in that way, where we're trying to look at the reinforcing efficacy of cigarettes, but also to see how those constraints placed on cigarettes would potentially lead to changes in purchasing of alternative tobacco products across all of these other available items. And the product of 
prices for the alternative products stayed the same as cigarette prices increased. And participants were asked to purchase products for one week. And to do that, they were given an experimental budget that was based on their current tobacco product consumption for one week. And we gave them a little extra wiggle room um, so that they could, so we could see more, um, more purchasing. And this was just to give a sort of constraint, much like they would have in the real world. And I do want to say that this the ETM has been validated using um, real world outcomes. So with adults, you know, you random you make sure that they actually get the products that they um, that they choose. And so it's been validated as in terms of you know hypothetical behavior and the ETM matches what people would really do. We did not actualize any of the outcomes in in youth for um, I hope obvious ethical reasons. So this is what this um, task looks like. It looks just like um, a sort of online store. Um, you add to cart um, what, you know, buy the number of cigarettes that you wanted or jewel pods, any other type of product that you wanted. We only had tobacco flavored jewel pods because that's all that was available in Rhode Island after our menthol ban for jewel pods. And what we found was that um, VLNCs were still purchased at very high prices. Um, Combustible products were in fact the most frequently purchased alternatives, which is concerning. We did see, again, this is hypothetical, but we did see that um, a lot of combustible use was very common. We didn't model a policy extension to other combustible products. As I mentioned in the brief Q&A, this may or may not be the case in the real world, whether this policy would extend to something like cigarillos and little cigars. Ideally it should, um, as those seem to be the most you know, the number one substitutable product in adults, and it seems that's that's similar in youth. And then it could be also extended to non-combustible products and on down the line. We did see that there was no indication of increased combustible purchasing in the VLNC group over time, which is good. So we didn't see that um, in the ETM, at least, that participants in indicated a greater willingness to use other alternative products of combustible nature. But we also, again, we're just concerned about the level of combustible use um, in this group if there were no nicotine reduction extension to those products. And we were also able to look at purchases for um, medicinal nicotine as well, which is included in the ETM. So this is um, a graph showing um, as study cigarette price increases, you can see that um, study cigarette um, purchasing decreased in a typical demand type um, pattern, but again, pretty high purchasing of cigarettes nonetheless. No real change in um, other types of purchasing across groups. Normally we might see kind of an X pattern where one particular product category increases. We see that frequently with adults. We didn't really see that here. I just did wanna point out the nicotine replacement um, category. Again, these were participants who were not intending to quit. Um, we didn't expect to see much NRT um, purchasing, but we thought we'd see some, especially after four weeks, um, as other studies with adults have shown kind of increases in quit intentions, but we really did not see any at all. Um, this mirrors real-world data showing that youth and young adults really do not use nicotine replacement therapy. Um, and this is a concern, because if a nicotine reduction standard is passed, we need to focus on how to provide support to youth who want to quit um, and we obviously want to encourage NRT use over something, you know, over other tobacco products as those are therapeutic and medicinal. And we, of course, eventually want to move youth to quitting. Again, the goal of the policy is not just to reduce smoking, but to encourage quitting. So that's something that we really need to think about and how to make NRT more viable as an alternative for youth um, in the event of this policy for those who might struggle with withdrawal and other, um, you know, other aspects of the policy. I want to briefly touch on flavor bans and specifically a menthol ban now that we're talking about the experimental tobacco marketplace. Um, the, when we conducted an experimental tobacco marketplace study with um, adults who smoked menthol cigarettes, and again, they cre completed an ETM task with and without other combustible products available, specifically little cigars and cigarillos. And again, the price of menthol cigarettes was increased across trials. And for this study, who we enrolled adults who smoke menthol. So we were looking to see if a menthol ban was in place or if menthol cigarettes became harder to acquire, which we're modeling by you know, increasing the price to a very high price, what participants would do. And in this study, we did actualize the outcomes because they were adults. So they got um, some of the products that they chose in the context of the study to take home. 
So what we found was that as menthol cigarette price increased, menthol cigarette purchasing decreased, as you can see with the green circles in each of the graphs, that's what you would expect. Um, however, you can see the purple and green lines that are below those increase such that it makes sort of an X pattern, particularly um, in the middle left panel. That is showing the purchase of non-menthol cigarettes, which were also available in the ETM for this study. So what we saw was that most commonly participants, once menthol cigarettes became prohibitively expensive, they switched to non-menthol cigarettes. And they also switched to menthol little cigars. That's in the top two panels, um, little cigars and cigarillos. Those were also commonly purchased as menthol cigarette price increased. Um, and menthol vapes in the bottom left corner were also, um, also purchased as menthol cigarette price increased. So this is again showing that we need to think about what people are going to switch to when the contact, when the confluence of these two policies may intersect. So if you have a menthol ban and a nicotine reduction policy in place, then you are going to have kind of add-on effects in terms of people looking for alternatives. And we need to think carefully about what alternatives we want to have available and how we want to encourage people to change their behavior. So in terms of the caveats that I brought up, again, I mentioned risk perceptions. I think those study really confirms the need for careful messaging about the risks of VLNC cigarettes and the relative risk of, al of alternative tobacco products so that participants and or youth in the real world can understand the continuum of risk. Um, not just about the risks of VLNCs and the risks of that are still inherent in any cigarette or combusted product, but also messaging the policy to different priority populations, not just youth, but other groups who um, may be affected differentially, such as African-Americans and sexual and gender minority populations, we need to make sure that the purpose of the policy is clear and that we make sure to position it as, a, as an opportunity to quit rather than um, you know, something that's going to create a lot of reactivity. And we, with that in mind, we need to encourage cessation. We, in all of our studies so far, we been looking at cigarette reduction. We haven't provided any form of counseling or, you know, um, anything like that. From a scientific perspective, it's because we want to not enroll people who are actively trying to quit and then say, here, use these cigarettes. But in the real world, you know, we want to make sure that people quit. We need to figure out how, when you've got nicotine reduction in play, how do we move people not just from reduction of smoking, but to cessation? How do we provide support for everyone, but specifically young adults, because NRT use, which is something that might be a first line kind of option for adults, is so rare in youth and they just don't tend to like NRT. So how do we make NRT an attractive option and support youth so that they actually quit? And flavor bans similarly, we'll need to carefully think them out in terms of how they're going to interact with a VLNC policy, how they're going to affect other products so that we can visualize the whole marketplace and how these policies would affect every product in the marketplace. Um, this incidentally is uh, where our research is moving towards. Um, our next grant that's under review is looking at these, you know, how to do health messaging with priority populations for a VLNC policy, how to encourage use of nicotine reduction or of nicotine replacement therapy and cessation services in priority populations who might be um, reluctant to do so or might be less likely to benefit from this policy so that we can make sure that we aren't leaving anyone behind if and when this policy gets passed. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take any further questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, Jamie, would you like to um, ask some questions? Absolutely, thank you so much, Rachel. I have so much I could ask, but I don't wanna take over everyone's time. One of the things I was really curious about is what you were talking about with nicotine replacement therapy. Um, I suppose this is kind of a two or three part question, but the last I knew, and maybe you can correct me on this, it wasn't just that NRT was not particularly popular amongst adolescents, but that actually there was no good evidence that okay. it helped them quit smoking. Does yeah. that remain the case as far as you know? So far as I know, for under 18s, that is still the case. It's a little bit complicated because, again, we, we started to think more about 18 to 25, and there are better data for these slightly older yeah. populations. But yes, and the canon answer is always, you know, adolescents, it doesn't really work because they don't like it or use it, particularly things like the patch, because if you're not smoking very much, 
the average patch is going to be unpleasant for you because that's going to be too much nicotine. So things like nicotine gum are typically what are used rather than the kind of gold standard combination therapy for that reason. So yeah, getting, getting, um, young, young adults and youth to use NR to use nicotine gum and things like that is, um, really understudied, actually. I was surprised that there were no NRT trials in young adults specifically. There's adolescents yeah. and then there's everybody. Yeah. So that's a gap in the literature that I can specifically mention, but that definitely exists. And we need to be doing that work to make, to understand if that's true. If, you know, young adults have different, res re you know, responses from under 18s and older 18s. Absolutely. And like, what I wasn't clear on with it, is it that do we think the reason that NRT isn't working in these trials in adolescents is that they're not using it or that nicotine metabolism is somehow different and it's just not working as well? I think it's primarily adherence. Um, okay. The trials was poor mm -hmm. okay. due to side effects. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, and I suppose like feeding on from this, it seems to me it's a really complicated space in terms of risk perceptions mm -hmm. and messaging, particularly around nicotine. So though my affiliation is Oxford, I've just moved to the States, I'm transitioning over here. Okay. And the messaging that I see here around nicotine mm -hmm. is different than the messaging that I've been seeing in England. Like the messaging here, from what I can tell around nicotine is pretty scary stuff, mm -hmm. right? Especially around nicotine and it harming adolescent brains and things like this. And so from that perspective, it makes sense to me that people would think, oh, well, a very low nicotine cigarette, that is likely to be mm -hmm. less harmful to me. And I wonder if your team has any thoughts or future research plans about how one can get the balance right on that. You know, adolescents are seeing everything. They're not just seeing e-cigarettes or just seeing very low nicotine content cigarettes. So how, how do we achieve consistency? Great question. I mean, I think it's so hard. I always say like, I'm happy I'm not a health communications person because I don't have to answer this, but I do feel like it's really hard. I mean, working in the lab with adolescents, you know, I'll ask them about alternative product use. And I've heard that so many adolescents who smoke cigarettes and I say, oh, okay, you know, do you use e-cigarettes? And they say, oh no, I would never use e-cigarettes. Those are so bad for you. So there's a, you know, that's confirmed what's in the literature that there's a persistent perception that e-cigarettes are just as harmful um, mm -hmm. and the, as combustible cigarettes, which they're not, again, I'm not saying that adolescents should be using cigarettes, but certainly they're less harmful than if you're already smoking. Um, mm -hmm. and so there's, yeah, there's persistent misperceptions of nicotine. Other work has been done in this area, um, showing that most people think that nicotine is what causes cancer in cigarettes. So again, that's a concern and that's been true for a while. And we, I don't think we've ever been too concerned about correcting that misperception because if it helps people not smoke, that's great. But now, um, you know, we really need to work harder, I think, to correct that misperception, but it is such a, such a nuanced message, you know, that it's less addictive, but it's not less harmful if you continue to smoke cigarettes. So it is very challenging. It's really tricky. And I think I saw a study in the last few years, which was of U.S. physicians, and the majority of them thought nicotine was what caused cancer from smoking. So it's yes. definitely not just young people. It's like yes. across the board that we have that particular issue. and. I wonder, like, just wondering out loud, how, if at all, acceptable it is to investigate whether e-cigarettes are a possible or appropriate alternative for adolescents who are smoking, mm -hmm. um, and we want to get them off, and we might be introducing very low nicotine content uh, combustible products, or is that kind of completely an unacceptable shift, I suppose. And maybe you yeah. can. Well, I guess I could say that based on a grant that I submitted <laughs> investigating that question, that it's unacceptable. Um, looking at for older adults, you know, 18 to 30 year olds, um, I think we have 21 to 30 year olds comparing NRT, because again, we don't have these studies compared, you know, looking at NRT in this group specifically, um, but relative to e-cigarettes, um, but there is a persistent feeling that e-cigarettes, you know, at least among the reviewers that are just as bad as, as cigarettes and that we shouldn't encourage that. And I mean, I understand that position um, to some extent, but, you know, it, again, if we don't, it, the, coming from a more practical policy, you know, stance, like we may end up in a situation where e-cigarettes have nicotine and cigarettes don't. And so we yeah. need to kind of model what that would look like if, as we suspect, it's likely that youth would turn to those and, you know, what would the outcomes be? So we don't really have great data on that right now. Okay. I'm so fascinated to see what <laughs> our team comes out with. Thanks so much. Thank you.
so we have a number of um, uh, questions and comments in the in the Q and A, and so I'll I'll, I'll start there, and I, I just remind everyone that uh, if you are in fact uh, uh, you have a question, please put it in the Q and A and not the chat. So uh, Jeff and and Sheila, if you could just put them in the Q and A uh, section, that would be great. So um, a couple of related questions in the in the Q and A, just about the experimental marketplace. Um, so, uh, did you consider uh, also including access to an you know an, an illicit market within this experimental marketplace that springs up? Uh, you know, the, these kind of illicit markets spring up anytime there's prohibition of any kind. And can you also, and a kind of a related question, can you confirm uh, exactly the the uh, prices that cigarettes were marketed as uh, at in this um, in in this marketplace? Yeah, so for the first question, we did not, we, um, there's been a lot of great work that's come out since the study was started about modeling illicit marketplaces using the ETM, and that is very exciting, and it there, um, I would love to do studies of that nature in the ETM, I have not done that yet, but yeah, that's a great idea, we are concerned about that as well, like modeling the extent to which people might turn to illicit marketplaces, um, mm -hmm. that's just yet another caveat that I didn't mention, but that's a great question, and yes, we have not done that with youth, but we are looking to do that in the future. Um, and in terms of the prices of the cigarettes, we in the EPM, we chose them where the price of a per cigarette in Rhode Island was like the middle point. So we could see lower and then higher um, prices, but well, a little bit more towards the low side. So the point is to kind of push up cigarette prices to where it's kind of prohibitively expensive to see what people would do when they aren't accessing their um, their cigarette at the same amount that they normally would. And so that's how we chose those prices. And we also did the budget the same way based on what cigarettes cost in Rhode Island currently. And and, and the prices were per cigarette, not prices per cigarette. were per cigarette. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, Jonathan has a question. Uh, Jonathan uh, folds, if, if a menthol uh, ban in cigarettes occurs, do you believe that fewer smokers would transition to other smoked products? Uh, for example, non-menthol cigarettes, if menthol e-cigarettes are legally available to switch to? That's a great question. Ideally, yes. I mean, ideally, if menthol cigarette, if you have a cigarettes that, again, like we saw in the menthol study, we and based on other data from Canada and other places, switching to non-menthol cigarettes in the event of a menthol ban is um, frequent, as it would, uh, you know, that's a very substitutable product. So having a nicotine reduction and menthol ban in place would hopefully discourage that most common, you know, or a common form of switching to um, menthol non-combustible products for adults. Um, my colleague and I, Amy Cohn, she has a grant looking uh, modeling the interaction between menthol and DLNC policies in young adults. So those results are coming out now. So we're we are explicitly looking at how using the ETM to see how those two policies would change young adult purchasing. Uh, great. Okay. And and so one question um, from Mike Pesco in the in the in the group here. Um, so it seems like your findings point to a large number of youths would uh, that they would react to very low nicotine cigarettes by looking around for products with high nicotine. Does this provide evidence in favor of the FDA authorizing a large number of high nicotine e-cigarettes and other low risk tobacco products as a strategy to avoid a black market for high nicotine cigarettes? That's a great question. And actually, again, I didn't mention that I didn't want to overwhelm everyone with like every study I've ever done, but there's a bit of a complicated question because it turns out that at, there's some evidence that actually high nicotine e-liquids for adolescents are a little bit aversive, um, again, because maybe they're too high. So when we tested an 18 milligram per milliliter e-liquid, that was less enjoyable for adolescents than a three milligram per milliliter. And there's also the question of um, but again, there's, there's so many things that are different about e-cigarettes than cigarettes. So things like, okay, if the nicotine in, in e-cigarettes is higher, then perhaps people are going to take fewer puffs to titrate. And so with each, then they're getting less exposure to the potential toxins in e-cigarette vapor if they're taking fewer puffs. So maybe that's beneficial relative to having lower nicotine, but they're taking more puffs to get to the same level of, you know, nicotine in their bloodstream. Um, but in general, I think that decreasing, there's a lot of strategies. I'm not an expert on illegal markets. I don't pretend to be, but um, there are a lot of strategies for reducing illegal markets other than alternative products, but alternative products are certainly one strategy that we could look at. And I do think we need to consider carefully and weigh the risks and benefits of having high nicotine alternatives. But I do, I do think for adults, it's important to have, um, to have alter non-combustible alternatives that are relatively low in harm 
beyond medicinal nicotine um, to discourage illegal markets and, you know, to make illegal markets less likely to be, to stay around, you know, less likely to be profitable if there's less demand in that way. Um, one question from the Q and A, have you, have you seen the highlight market uh, marker vape? No, I have not, <laughs> but that is disturbing. <laughs> I think yeah. that is interesting. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so uh, one question about the risk risk perceptions. Um, you know, it, it seems kind of strange that, you know, adolescents would really be able to, like, should we expect them to accurately kind of uh, forecast the long-term health implications of, of cigarettes? And do you, do you think that there's... Um, uh, maybe a better way to ask those questions? There probably definitely is a better way to ask those questions. Um, so yes, there's all, I feel like there's a lot more we could do in this area. I will say that in general, even among adolescents who smoke, um, you know, risk perceptions of cigarettes are high. You know, adolescents know that cigarettes are bad. Um, again, something about these cigarettes may think that they're like a little bit less harmful. They weren't, they didn't say, thankfully, you know, oh, these cigarettes seem like they're fake or they're not real and I could smoke as many of them as I want to. They seem like they just were less harmful than, you know, than a normal cigarette, which again, in one particular axis of nicotine exposure is true. Um, but in the, we have a lot to learn as far as what do, what are we going to be saying about these, these cigarettes? Are we going to be saying these cigarettes have 95% less nicotine? And what, um, you know, as in our previous discussion, what are people going to take that to mean? We really don't want for participants to sort of be looking for a safer cigarette and thinking that this is a, this that that is this. So we need to really be clear on why this policy is and that these cigarettes are not safer in the long term than other cigarettes. But it's very challenging. Um and and I was a little bit curious about your sample selection, the the decision to go with the um the people who have no intention of quitting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, it just, it, it, it doesn't seem surprising that if these people don't intend to quit and you give them a product that they don't like, you know, then they're not going to like the policy, right? Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think that, uh, uh, I mean, can, can you, can you maybe um, speculate a little bit about how your results would generalize to the, the full group who maybe the full population of, of, of users who, in fact, some of whom may want to quit? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, we primarily included those folks because we didn't feel ethically like we could enroll people who are actively trying to quit and then say, but you need to use these studies, studies, these cigarettes in the context of this study, especially when we didn't know how they would, if they would have any benefit for youth at all. But in our next round of studies, we are doing that. And again, we, we are re-enrolling anyone, those who want to quit and those who don't. And we're explicitly including cessation services, again, as we hope it would be implemented in the real world. But I agree in terms of policy, that's always the case with policy support. You know, those who are going to be most affected by the policy are going to be um, the least supportive of it. But it's interesting, um, my colleague, Rachel Denlinger, after has done some qualitative work um, on menthol ban support as well, and VLNC support as well. And you see that while people don't want it to affect them, you know, they don't want us to take away their menthol cigarettes or reduce the nicotine in their cigarettes. Obviously, that makes a lot of sense. They do kind of support it for future generations. So they often, especially in the menthol group, you know, they said, I think it would be good because it'll help you know, that kids won't get addicted to smoking and stuff. So there is, it's kind of an ambivalence, you know, they don't want it to affect them, but they see that it would have a benefit for future generations. So I think that's something that we need to kind of think about in terms of framing, um, kind of getting people to think about the larger context. I think that's true with nicotine reduction as well, that it, um, to kind of reduce the reactivity of the people who will be experiencing immediate withdrawal, but trying to think about how this would be benefiting future you know, young people to keep them from getting addicted in the first place. Great. Well, thanks so much, Rachel. This is this is really wonderful. Um, I'm going to kick it back to Christian, uh, who will who will take us out. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 203 people for your participation. Have a top notch weekend. <laughs>